Good morning, everyone. I think the mic's working all right. You hear me all right? Uh, welcome to St. Paul's Reformed Church. And for those who are joining us on the television, welcome. Uh, St. Paul's is the big yellow uh, church building next to McDonald's on Park Avenue. Um, just a few announcements before we start. Um, last week, we had uh, a uh, donation for the soup kitchen we referred to as Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, thanks to everybody who gave. Um, we collected $465 for the soup kitchen. Uh, for those of us who are singing in the men's ensemble, don't forget that we'll rehearse for a few minutes uh, this morning, uh, right after the service. Um, the, uh, our daily bread devotionals are available in the North X for March, April, and May. Uh, please feel free to pick them up. Next Sunday, we we're going to have a luncheon afterwards. Um, so put that on your schedule. And while we're munching on our luncheon, we will uh, chat about uh, outreach potential opportunities and ideas. Um, uh, the events this week, uh, there we continue with our Tuesday evening uh, Bible study via Zoom, and we are in First Kings. Um, this Wednesday is uh, our turn to, to help with the soup kitchen, and that starts at 10 a.m. And if anybody is interested in doing that who doesn't routinely do that, um, maybe Linda, Charlotte, some folks in the back can raise their hands and they, they can point you in that direction. Um, the newsletter, anybody who has uh, contributions to the March newsletter, they'll be due Thursday of this week. Um, this will be the first newsletter that has a spotlight on one of the uh, members. So uh, that's a change that we started, we'll be starting um, in the newsletters, a, a brief spotlight on some individual with, uh, just to help us you know, learn some background a little bit more about one another, uh, particularly for those of us who are newer here. Um, and then next week, we'll be back, back here and again, luncheon after the service next week. Okay. 
Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, and it's verses 35 and 36. 1 Kings, chapter 18, verses 35 and 36. And the context here is uh, with what we went over last week in the service, um, Elijah the prophet and the, the showdown between the prophets of Baal and, and Elijah, the prophet of God. Verse 35, the water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Then at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Today, let it be known that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning. We pray that you would be with us and, and pour out your spirit upon us, that we would hear your word, and that we would be taught by it, instructed in our hearts and our minds. Be with us, Lord, as we worship. We thank you for this opportunity as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Those that are willing and able, if you stand for our opening hymn, it's hymn number 347, all creatures of our Lord, our God and King. So we we'll be only seeing the first four verses. First four verses. <laughs> him, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I didn't know she, she, she was getting a thousand dollar bonus for that. I don't, I don't, I just have this, I don't, I don't know about that guy. I, mean, I, I see him. You did a duck too. I can't stand CJ and all that. Poor Zachary. I don't like nobody in the house. I don't talk to him right now. I don't bother him. That's his job. So horrible there. Why would I let somebody else to do it? 
but I guess you know, her, her one turn was so uh, long, yeah. Let's and see. There was one thing I was going to add to the, there is a sign up sheet for the luncheon in the back, uh, just to help with the ordering and stuff. So if you want to attend, please uh, let us know you're coming. And one other thing I was going to do before we get to the New Testament reading, which is James 5, I'm going to and I think it, it, maybe this was just a, an oversight. But I'm going to read from 1 like Kings 8, 35 and 36. Um, in the morning. It was good, yeah. I think maybe because, you, know, he, um, you added a 1 to your 1 Kings 18. You know, I do that all the time. And I had to check to make sure I hadn't put 18. <laughs> so... Uh, no offense, but I'm glad it was your mistake and not mine. <laughs> okay, this is being broadcast over television. <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh, in that regard, I would say to those who are joining us via Zoom, uh, I try to pin our window, and some of you on Zoom would know what that means. Sometimes I miss that or something changes. So I ask that you mute yourself. Uh, when you're on Zoom so that your picture doesn't pop up as the main screen. Um, so just a reminder to mute yourself if you're on Zoom, but thank you for joining us. Um, let me read 1 Kings 8, 35 and uh, 36, just because this brings us back to Solomon's prayer uh, in the dedication of the temple. And I want us to hear these words as we've been talking about Elijah and the drought, and why the drought? Um, so it says, when the heavens, Solomon prays, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, and they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and of your people, Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given your people for an inheritance. Those are the words of Solomon. And so now we're going to turn to James chapter five. And James, as you may know, is a book of what we might call practical Christianity. James is telling us how these things work out. You know, this is uh, years after the resurrection, and he's talking about how these things actually work out in the lives of people, and he's very practical. And um, we're at the end of James. This is chapter five, and so I'm going to read 14 to 20, uh, and D.A. Carson in, his, in one of his uh, commentaries just notes that James quotes from a lot of the Old Testament prophets uh, and people, and then he kind of pinnacles it here with Elijah, a reference to Elijah. Hear God's word as it comes to us now from James uh, chapter 5, verses 14 to 20. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I just want you to think about that. Elijah prayer, the turning from sin and salvation, to salvation. I think about those things as we will look at um, 
We're only going to look at six verses, uh, I think, today, or maybe seven, seven verses uh, in 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. So it's a short passage today, but we'll look at those, and all these things come together. So I'll try to draw them together uh, in the message. All right, so now we will take up the Confession of Faith in the Nicene Creed. That's 138 in your hymnal. And uh, we'll recite this together. Let us um, stand, if able and willing. Try to, I'm going to use my glasses. Okay. All right. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one universal and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer, and it is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon of that forgiveness of sin, and uh, it's also intercessory. We will pray for a number of folks who are on our hearts and minds today, and uh, there is a prayer list on the back. I will um, add a couple of things to that. If you want to make note, uh, we're praying for um, a family that Maria knows, uh, a young woman uh, passed away and she has children. She was only 27, right? 27 years old and she died. She has children and we want to keep the family in prayer. Um, and then of course, Smokey, some of you remember Smokey, Smokey passed away. We want to keep Smokey's family in prayer as well. Um, and then also Kyle and Hope uh, are under the weather this morning. That's why they're not here. So we want to keep them in prayer. I've also noted the Duke's family who's coming from, who has been coming from Tyanesta and um, they're on demand from COVID, uh, but they're not taking, they want to take precautions. We'll say that. And so uh, perhaps be with us next week. So uh, let's keep those folks in prayer, as well as those in the back. Um, let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we continue in your grace this morning in worship of you, we come in prayer. We come to speak with you, to converse with you. You call us uh, to do that as our God, our creator, our sustainer and redeemer of, of life. We are called to come before your throne of grace and to bring our concerns to you and to know that through Jesus Christ, he has 
been and is the one time for all offering, a sacrifice that was acceptable to you for the sins of your people once and for all. And through him and his resurrection, our sins are paid for and we are justified. We are righteous before you in him. And that gives us, that affords us the privilege to come and to make our requests known in our hour of need. And so we come, Father, in that way to seek the forgiveness of our own sin, to know that we, although in Christ, we still commit sin today, and it is ever before you. And we long for that to be over. We long for the return of Christ and our entrance into glory with all of that behind us. But yet today, we still sin. And we pray for forgiveness of that. We call upon your name for that. Forgive us in the ways that we fail to serve you and fail to love one another as you have loved us. We fail to be uh, the roles that you call us to be, the, the husbands and the wives, the brothers, the sisters, the sons and daughters, and so forth. Father, forgive us the ways we have failed to be your people and to live according to the design of the image in which we have been made. Father, we pray not only for the forgiveness of our sin, but for the knowledge that we are yours and you are ours. To know that we have been pardoned, that we have been forgiven, to experience the freedom that comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. To know that you love us and you care for us. And again, that is relationship, that is belonging to one another. It is covenant. So we pray for that as well. Father, we also think of those who are struggling today. We pray for this uh, family who's lost a 27-year-old mother. And we pray that you would take them into your hands. For you know all of these things, the needs that we have and the needs that they have. Pray that you comfort and that you would be making yourself known even now to these children and to those who mourn her loss. We pray that for Smokey's family as well. We also pray for healing for the Duke's uh, family and for Kyle and Hope. And we pray uh, for Aunt Jeannie and for Brenda and for Harry and George and Kathy and Wilda. And we pray for Barb. We think of Susie and Nora, so many names. Uh, and they go on and, and Father, some of these folks we haven't met, but again, we trust that you know everything that they need as the God who is holy and good and right, and just and merciful and kind. Father, we commit them to you. We pray for uh, our congregation. We thank you for the privilege it is to gather and to worship you free from persecution um, and to know that you have gifted your church. And just in the ways that you call us, we pray for faithfulness and growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior that we might Speak to this community with gentleness and respect, with love and mercy. We pray that not only for our congregation, but all those congregations in this area who lift up your name in faithfulness. We ask that you bless and encourage and strengthen to that end. And so, Father, we pray these things along with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
stand in prayer. Praise him. It's hymn number 40 in the hymnal. The Lord's my shepherd, I will not want. Okay, it's time for the young people's message. Okay, young people, we've talked about this before. I know I say that a lot, but we have talked about this before. This is one of those things that, um, that you know, when, when I'm going through the Bible, and perhaps you've noticed this too, that the Bible repeats things. It, it does repeat things over, you know, for us. And this is one of those things that it kind of repeats. And so I take the young people's message from our passage. And so the thing I want to talk to you about this morning, which you've heard before, is um, what do we often do when we come together to celebrate? What is it that we often do when we come together to celebrate? Whether it's a wedding, whether it's a birthday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, especially Thanksgiving, um, anything we celebrate, this seems to always be part of it. What do you think that is? What do we do when we come together to celebrate? Right? We eat. We eat. We always eat and drink and we gather around a table. There's a meal. And that's important. Why do you think we do that? Why does that always happen at a celebration? It's fellowship, hmm? togetherness, acceptance, belonging, enjoying one another's company. It just seems to be part of our makeup as we are made in the image of God. So I want you to be thinking about those things. And today in our passage, there is actually a mention of a meal. Mention of a meal. So listen to the text in the message and let me know after who is enjoying the meal and what are they celebrating? What are they celebrating? Who's actually participating in the meal? And then what are they celebrating? So that's the message. And... 
what would be the treat? Huh? What do you think the treat would be? It's a meal of celebration. It is a time of joy. <laughs> Almond joy. We got it in the front here. <laughs> okay. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to speak to these young hearts and young minds. And we pray for them as they read their Bible, as they encounter your word time and again to pick up on the repetition of certain things, to see that with a meal there is celebration, and with a celebration there is a meal, a coming together, a togetherness, a belonging to one another, and an acceptance with that meal. We pray that they grow in their understanding of these things. We ask it for them and we ask it for all of us, all to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And last week we looked at the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And so we're going to pick up with that. Uh, the after word time here. We're reading verses 41 to 46. That's to the end of chapter 18. First King. So starting with verse 41. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard. And I got a lecture after service last week that my reading was not exactly the New American Standard, even though I said it was the New American Standard. So I'm going to this week say I'm reading from the New American Standard, but I reserve the right to do translation on the fly. Okay, so if my words are not exactly the New American Standard, then that perhaps is why, or maybe I'm just misreading. But anyway, if you have questions, we're going to look at these words, and your translation may be different. So if there are questions, uh, we're going to address some of these words. So hopefully your questions will be answered. But if they're not, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm always open to a lecture after the service. So. Okay, let's look at 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. Now, Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go back seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Here ends the reading of God's word. Short little passage this morning. So I started this series on Elijah and Elisha because I wanted to understand. So it's a little bit selfish in that way. I wanted to understand in a greater way, why, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am, the disciples mention Elijah among the answers. That is, the people uh, are recognizing. Why do people of Jesus's day, as they experience Jesus's ministry among them, why do they think of Elijah? 
So over these last number of weeks, I'm, I'm beginning to get it. And I hope that what I have been communicating is helping you to get it as well. Um, our text today keeps us moving in that direction. It is a celebratory meal and it is life renewing rain. So we're gonna look at this passage, these, this short passage here. And the thing I'd like you to take is this, take away is this, king and people celebrate a meal while God answers Elijah's prayer for life renewing rain. King and people celebrate a meal while God answers Elijah's prayer for life renewing rain. Our context, Elijah, his name meaning my God is Yahweh, comes onto the scene. He's God's covenant prosecutor. Ahab has gone off to serve Jezebel. Uh, no, I'm sorry, to serve Baal because Jezebel, his wife, has influenced him. So under that influence, Ahab, the king of Israel, has brought in Baal worship. But Elijah declares to Ahab a drought and subsequent famine and it's all for the purpose of turning the hearts of his people back to him. We saw that last week. And, you know, so is this judgment, is this curse, is it mercy, is it discipline, is it healing, is it restoration, and could it be all of the above? But after three, three and a half years, the drought and famine lead to a showdown between Yahweh and Ahab's false god Baal. Under Elijah's direction, it takes place on Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel, this is to the west. Um, let me think how you would see it. It would be to the west. <laughs> so the Mediterraneans over here and Mount Carmel would be a mountain range that it would have its um, western, we'll say its western slopes descending into the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so I just want you to have that picture in your head that Mount Carmel is on the west coast next to um, the Mediterranean Sea with its slopes, its western slopes descending toward the sea. And so there really is, um, as we look at this, there really is no contest between what is real and what is make-believe. And we saw that with the prophets of Baal, how they received no voice, no answer, no attentiveness from Baal, from their make-believe God. But Elijah's prayer, however, is answered. The sacrifice, atoning sacrifice, is consumed by fire. The altar and water, all of it consumed. And God vindicates himself and his prophet. The people respond in agreement, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And the prophets of Baal are put to death at the brook Kishon. And there still is no rain. The rain is yet to come. And that's what we look at today. That gives us our context, kind of an immediate context. And so we come to verse 41, and I'm just going to take these verses pretty much uh, one by one, except for maybe a few of them. So verse 41, go up, eat, and drink. Elijah said to Ahab, and this is the first mention of Ahab since verse 20. I just want you to note that here. Elijah says to Ahab, um, and it's the first mention of Ahab since. We may not even have known Ahab was actually present, but he was there. And Elijah addresses him directly. And he says, go up, eat, and drink. And so to go up, we were told the last part was that they came down to the brook Kishon. So uh, Ahab's with them. The people gathered the prophets. Ahab with them gathered the prophets. They come down to the brook Kishon and the judgment is enacted against them. And now Elijah is saying to Ahab, go up. Go up, eat and drink to celebrate a meal uh, with the people. And so they're going back up. It is a time to celebrate. There is no rain yet, but the promise of rain is sure. Elijah hears it. It's not there, but he hears it, doesn't he? God has heard 
and responded to his prophet, and the people have turned and confessed Yahweh. And when I say God has heard and responded to his prophet, we think of that prayer Elijah prays uh, at the offering, at the time of the offering. And uh, I will just mention this quickly as an aside. I think I, think I have enough time to do this. Um, Elijah, you know, we, we question, Elijah's a prophet, right? And we think of the prophet as bringing God's word to the people, and we think of the priest as bringing the people's concerns to God. But I'm going to suggest, and I suggested this earlier in the Sunday morning Bible study, that Elijah is more than a prophet. Elijah is more than a prophet. In fact, he's acting priestly. And so do we say that Elijah actually made the offering, or did Elijah prepare for the offering? So those are things to think about. And then I also connect John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist, what was his mission? He was to prepare the way, <laughs> right? For, and so when I think of Elijah here, does he make the offering or does he prepare uh, the way for the offering? Just a thought. So think about those things. But this is what happened. And God, Elijah prayed that that would happen, and it did. God heard him, God responded, God paid attention. All of the things that Baal didn't do, God, Yahweh, did, and he consumed everything. And so now Elijah hears the rain. It's not there yet, but he hears the roar of it. And he has sent Ahab and the people up to celebrate the meal. So God has heard his prophet in one sense. The people have turned and confessed Yahweh, he is God, and they have carried out the judgment of God upon the prophets, the real troublers of Israel. So we know now that Ahab is there and he is with the people as a witness to these events and perhaps even participating in the judgment. Um, so he tells, Elijah tells Ahab to go up. They've come down to the brook, and now they are to go up and to celebrate the meal. In that culture, we know that a meal signifies, signifies sorry, togetherness, um, acceptance, relationship restored. When you sit down for a meal together, it says acceptance, belonging to one another, that kind of thing. Not too far from what we do today, but that is the idea in that culture. And so here we have king and people together. And not only that, at the direction of the prophet of God. And so I want us to think about how and what that means. That relationship is restored. And so that hearts are turned and that they are together in who they are. And it's time to celebrate that, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. Rain in that part of the world, when we think of rain in that part of the world, just on a natural basis, without any drought, rain and water is life. And how much more so that there has been a drought for three and a half years. Water is life. So the enemy is defeated, the hearts are turned, and the sound of the roar of life is coming. Then we come to verses 42 to 44. Elijah goes up to the top of Carmel. There is no rain yet, and Elijah doesn't uh, go up to eat and drink. It says, but he does go up. Now, he could have, I have in the NASB, but, um, but it could be that Elijah actually uh, joins in the meal itself and then goes up to the top of Carmel. And whatever the case is, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. This, I'm going to suggest, is a posture of prayer. Elijah is going to pray for the rain. Remember what he said? He said, the drought will not end, but only by my word. And we know that, you know, what we've seen with Elijah and God and their relationship, you know, it's Elijah is faithful and obedient to the Lord. The Lord speaks through his prophet and the Lord hears his prophet. And so here, Elijah at the top of Carmel takes a posture of prayer. In fact, there is an interesting uh, thing here uh, in this posture of prayer. Young's literal 
translation renders it this way, has it in the English that um, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he stretched himself out upon the earth. Stretched himself. Do you remember him stretching himself out upon something else? Do you remember that? Well, here he's stretching himself out upon uh, the earth. Just an interesting note. That's Young's literal translation for that verse. So the writer doesn't mention it explicitly, but surely Elijah is praying. And from experience, the reader has every confidence that God, Yahweh, will respond. Elijah sends his servant to look. And he said to his servant, and this is a young lad, that would be the word uh, in the Hebrew has that meaning, a young, uh, young man, young lad, go up now, look toward the sea. So remember, we're on the western slopes going down to the Mediterranean Sea, and they're up probably close to the peak. And so uh, he sends his young lad, there is servant, to look. And he looks toward the sea, and what does he say? comes back and says, there is nothing. There is nothing. So that perhaps the writer is creating a little tension, a little anticipation, if you will. And so he said, go back seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. Now, what do you have in your translation? I've read from the NASB, it says, go back go back. So this young lad comes and says, there's nothing. And Elijah says, go back. He may say, return. But that word is the same word that we would render repent. In other words, turn back. And he does it seven times. You know, I started to look at the seven, and we often think of the numbers in the Bible, and seven is a completeness. Seven is a number of perfection or completeness. Um, and so I thought about that, and then I thought, wait, what is he telling him to do seven times? He's telling him to turn around, to return, to go back. And so he does, and it's on the seventh time that he says, there's this small cloud, like a man's hand coming up from the sea. So why seven times? It is interesting. I just offer some of that for your thoughts, but previously God answered Elijah's prayer without such repetition, but this time seven times. And um, that there is nothing does create a little bit of tension. And on the seventh time, behold, the cloud as small as man's hand. It begins small, but will soon cover the sky and bring a heavy shower. I think of things that begin small, like a mustard seed, but are to grow huge. Here is this small cloud that is going to bring life-giving rain in a big way. So... The rain coming is a testimony to God's faithfulness in forgiving sin. If you recall, now think what we said from uh, Solomon's prayer. Do you remember that? It's about forgiving sin, restoring relationship. Solomon prayed, then hear thou in heaven. It's when the people turn, hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel. Elijah tells his servant to go up to Ahab and tell him to prepare his chariot and go down so that the rain does not stop him. And I think it is the idea of avoiding mud. He wants Ahab to go to return to Jezreel. And he wants him to get there before the rain causes him a problem. So Kale and Delich. And uh, just a funny aside, I'm typing this morning. Oh, I shouldn't tell you that. I'm typing this up this morning. <laughs> and I type in, I'm going to quote Kale and Delich. These are two German uh, theologians, um, older, you know, Kale and Delich. And uh, they're from their commentary on these verses. And I type Kale and 
Delich. And you know what? A little line comes up. Do you ever have that in your word processor? A little line comes under the words, and I, I mouse over it, and it says, Kale und Delich. <laughs> so you have to have the German, I guess. You know, if you're going to type Kale and Delich, you've got to have Kale und Delich. Anyway, Kale and Delich point out that the plain of Jezreel. The plain of Jezreel, after three years of drought, with its soil composed of clay and now lacking vegetation, uh, would have had a very thick layer of dust. And when you add a lot of water to dust, moms, you know what the children get into, right? It is mud. And this is what's likely going to happen is a heavy, very heavy mud. And so... Uh, there, the Ahab's chariot's wheels would probably be stuck. Anyway, Elijah sends him off, um, and he wants Ahab to reach Jezreel, a place, a home, his home, uh, before the rains uh, prevent him. And then we come to verses 45 and 46. From the small cloud over the sea to a black cloud now covering the sky and the winds and rain descending, Ahab rides to Jezreel. The king is returning home and the rains are bringing new life to the land. And God directs Elijah. God directs Elijah, my God is Yahweh, to be there before him. Why does he direct Elijah to be there, to gird up his loins, to give him the strength and all that he needs to get there before the king? Why would he do that? What is the purpose I'm only going to offer what I think is the purpose. Uh, you may have other thoughts, but I offer mine just to um, suggest something. So I think, he's, I think he's going to be there to welcome the king. I, I think he's going to be there because this is a restored relationship between prophet and king. And I think Elijah's going to be there for support for Ahab in the presence of Jezebel. Now things are going to turn again. We know that. But at this point in time, at this moment, we see king and people and prophet in restored relationship to each other and to Yahweh. And what a picture it is. So a few points of application I close. Elijah seems to be more than a prophet. He prepares the atoning sacrifice that God himself consumes by fire. And he, along with the king and people, carry out judgment upon the prophets of Baal. They then celebrate with a meal, a celebration of vindication, of restoration, of healing, and victory. And Elijah prays for rain, that is life-renewing rain, testifying to God's acceptance, God's renewed, restored covenant relationship, and blessing. This is what we are seeing. We saw in the beginning with chapter 17 and verse 1, the curse that was to come as a result of provoking the God, the living God of Israel. And now we see on the other side of it, the restoration of relationship, the renewal of it, of the covenant itself and the blessing that comes as a result of turning back to Yahweh and finding the forgiveness of sin. All of it is a beautiful picture, a beautiful type, a shadow of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the once for all, never to be repeated atoning sacrifice and the life renewing vindication and justification of his resurrection. It is no wonder, at least for me, it is no wonder when Jesus asks, who do people say? that I am. Elijah is among the answers. King and people celebrate a meal while God answers Elijah's prayer for life renewing rain. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly father, again, we thank you for who you are, the wisdom of your word, your amazing grace, and the way you communicate to us, your people, though we are fallen and broken in the image in which we have been made, you care for us. 
you speak to us in ways that we understand and can grab hold of. And you paint for us a picture of your great plan of redemption through your son. And that you have given him as an offering to restore us to life, to restore the image in which we have been made. Help us to understand what that means. New humanity, the age of resurrection, and the newness of life. We pray that for all here. And anyone who does not know that now, we ask that you open their heart to it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there really an amen to stand for our closing hymn? It's hymn number 468. He's out my People of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for coming. That concludes our service today. So have a blessed week.